God opening the gates of the prison and letting, uh, letting the disciples out. And then in chapter 5, we have Ananias and Sapphira and uh, God uh, working in power in, that, uh, in the kingdom church and executing judgment immediately upon sin. Now then, we come to, uh, and by the way, uh, <clears throat> then here in chapter 6, uh, let's look at chapter 6, and I'll just read a few verses. In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily administration or daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look out among yourself, look out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of the faith and of the Holy Ghost. Then it lists them here. Verse 6, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And look at verse 7, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied at Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Well, it's, it's a good thing the priests got saved. It's always a good thing, because a lot of the opposition was coming from the priests. Now, I need to hurriedly look at our notes tonight, and for those of you that don't have the notes, I'll try to hopefully say, uh, reference you to the Scripture every once in a while so you won't feel left out. I don't want you to feel left out. First of all, here in the first few verses, the verses I've just read, is we have the selection of seven table waiters. These are men who were called to wait on tables. No, the disciples said, we will not leave the Word of God to wait on tables. And... Uh, so rapid growth in the Pentecostal church caused administrative problems. And what you have is you have the Grecians here complaining about the widows being neglected. And uh, the twelve apostles, then they called a meeting when this complaining started. They called a meeting and they gave instruction that seven men be chosen to deal with this problem. Now this is not the kind of complaining in a church that was malicious. This is the kind of complaining that was legitimate. There was not a malicious intent on the part of these uh, folks to complain. In fact, they thought that the neglect was intentional. And so, uh, let me just say who the Grecians were. The Grecians were Jews that were scattered throughout the Gentile world. And these Jews had adopted the language and the opinion of the Greeks. And thus they are called Hellenist many times in the Bible. They are called Hellenist. And it's noteworthy to that to notice that the seven men, if you check their names, all of their names are Greek names. And uh, so it shows here the willingness of the apostles to let these Grecian Jews care for this problem. And by doing that, it shows that they were not biased, that the apostles were not biased, nor were they, was there intentional neglect on their part. They weren't trying to harbor this thing to themselves. They said, all right, you Grecians, you take care of it. And yet they were Jews. In fact, if you'll notice that when the complaint took place, it talks about later on that some of these people were... Uh, look at verse 9. Then there arose certain of the synagogue. Well, there were several hundred synagogues in, Ju in Jerusalem at that time, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines. And you go ahead and look at the different names, the Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and Cilicia in Asia, disputing with Stephen. It's a synagogue. These are Jews. But they are Jews of the dispersion, and they are called Grecians or Hellenists. And they would come into Jerusalem, and they had their own special synagogues, maybe because of the different languages they spoke. And that would explain part of the phenomenon there on the day of Pentecost when they said, we hear every man speak in our own language where we were born. So these, uh, the Jews, so uh, <clears throat> this is what's going on here in this day of Pentecost. Pentecost was, of course, as we said, was a feast of the ingathering. So you have not only the Jews that are home-born, the twelve apostles, but you have other Jews scattered from the Gentile world. And I indicated to you that the two loaves, I believe, now they can be typical of the church composed of Jew and Gentile if you want to do that. And I don't think it does any violence to the truth. But uh, I believe intentionally the two loaves represented the, the, two tr the 12 tribes of Israel, the two and the ten, and they were to be one loaf. 
And that was the idea here that all the Jews would ultimately be gathered back to their homeland and there would be one nation under God and they'd have one king. Now, notice we say that many, many fundamental Baptists suppose that this administrative act needs to take place in the New Testament church today. They think a local church must have, must have deacons before it becomes a true church. And this is false. Uh, the, the case before us here in Acts is not the body of Christ. It is the, the, the kingdom, uh, the beginning of the kingdom of heaven. And also, you'll notice that these men were selected to distribute food. And uh, that food was to be distributed to the needy Grecian widows. And in most cases today, when deacons are selected, that is not the premise for selecting deacons. Matter of fact, a deacon usually doesn't think that's his job. Most deacons think their job is an administrative position to run the pastor. That's really what they think. And the deacon should be selected to carry out the orders of the pastor and the needs of the church, not to administrate. You know, nothing worse than a pastor trying to take orders from seven deacons. It should be seven deacons taking orders from the pastor. See? But most deacons don't want that. They don't want jobs assigned to them. They want an administrative meeting where they can assign jobs to the pastor. That's not the office of a deacon. It's not the purpose. The purpose, if these are deacons, and by the word, the word deacon is not in here. You'll check in vain for the word deacon. It isn't there. But the word deacon simply means servant. If you look it up in any language, it just means a servant. And really, they were servants. And you know what their title was? They were table waiters. In other words, the disciples, the people were bringing. Remember back when they were bringing the, the food and they were bringing the price of their land? And remember Barnabas? Uh, he sold land and he brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And, of course, that inspired Ananias and Sapphira to get into the act, remember? And they brought a certain portion. They were bringing this and putting it at the feet of the apostles. And the twelve apostles were distributing it. But in that administration, these Grecian widows were evidently being neglected. And so the Greeks, the, the, Gre the, the Grecian Christians, the Hellenists, they begin to complain. Our widows are being neglected in this administration. So they said, all right, you get seven men. You, check, you call them. You pick them. And we'll put them over this business because we're not to leave the Word of God and serve tables. Literally, it was distributing foodstuffs. That's all it was. Like Jesus Christ fed the thousands with the twelve, with the fish and the loaves. He called his disciples. He broke it up, gave it to them, and they distributed it. Now, the idea today of a deacon in a church is so far removed from that, it's ridiculous. You know what the average church has is they have a board of deacons, and they're supposed to be the wealthy, influential people that make the decisions in the church. That is, the administrative decisions. And then you have a board of trustees. They don't need to know anything. They just need to be able to paint and drive nails and so on. So that's the way the average church operates. Now, the reason you have trustees in a church is because the government requires all, in cor all corporations to have trustees. You don't have trustees because it's a Bible office. There's no such thing in the Bible. You do it because when you have a corporation, you have to have trustees. You understand? That's the only reason you have them. And the only reason you had these seven men is because this Pentecostal church had multiplied into thousands. And now the job was so big that the apostles couldn't take care of all of it. So this idea that uh, Jesus organized the church, and first of all, he called the twelve, and then he got a treasure. Now, I know Baptist pastors, this is what they say. You cannot have a New Testament Baptist church. First of all, it has to have a mother church. And that has to be a Baptist bride church. I know what I'm talking about. They have to have a mother church. And the only, or the only authentic mother, hey kids, pay attention to me. The only mother church, the only mother church is a Baptist bride church. That was baptized by John the Baptist. That's the only one that will be valid. Then you have to have a treasure, Judas, really, Judas. And then you have to have deacons, Matthew or Acts 6. And then you have to have business meetings. Oh, I know what I'm talking about. I'm not, I'm not playing games with you. Then you have to have closed communion, upper room, with the disciples. You understand? That's where all this comes from. That whole nine yards. None of that is New Testament church. That is a kingdom ministry that the Lord Jesus was doing, you see. And it's amazing to me that the Lord had, had closed communion there in the upper room, but there were multitudes of disciples of John the Baptist and of Jesus Christ and the Twelve. Why weren't they invited? I guess they were all backslidden. I don't know. 
Now, so I don't want to get sidetracked on that because that's not even in my intent tonight, but I have a tendency to do that in my old age. Now, <clears throat> so verse 6 and 7, verse 6 and 7 show the apostles' approval, and the way they showed their approval is they put their hands on these seven men, that is, they laid hands on them, and they prayed. They imparted nothing to them. All it does is imply is when you lay your hands on them, it means you approve of the decision. That's why Paul told Timothy to lay his hands, lay not hands suddenly on any man. The idea here is don't be hasty to ordain anybody into the ministry. And when you lay your hands on somebody in this fashion, you are showing that you approve of the choice. So you have to be careful in that kind of thing because it's an act. And God showed his approval by continued blessing. Look down at verse 7. And the word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem. Not only that, notice Stephen's miracle. Apostolic power was granted to Stephen, miraculously. And, uh, but his ministry was opposed by his own people, by the Grecian Jews. And uh, they were called libertines. The reason for this is at one time they had been in bondage, no doubt, and they'd been set free. Perhaps they were part of a Roman, they may have been a Roman slave. You read later on in the Apostle Paul, he was, uh, he was, uh, he was being mistreated. And they said, is it right for you? Do you have liberty to mistreat a Roman citizen? This fellow said, are you a Roman citizen? He said, I am. And the guy, the guy taking care of Paul said, with, with a great price did I purchase this freedom. Paul said, I was born free. That is, Paul had a citizenship that was Roman. He had a citizenship that was Jewish. But he had a citizenship in heaven as well. Paul was a citizen of three different countries. He was a legal Roman citizen. Now, there were ways to you could become a Roman citizen. Sometimes you could fight in the arena and you could earn your citizenship. Sometimes you were born in an aristocratic family and you got your citizenship. Sometimes you could purchase it with money if you knew the right people. You could get your Roman citizenship. I don't know how these, these libertines, these Jews, got their Roman citizenship, but that's what it means. They had been slaves. And that's the idea. It's not talking about the Epicureans there in, in Acts uh, on Mars Hill. That's not what the word libertine means in this text. It's talking more about liberated, liberty. And uh, so they found that they, uh, you know, there may, these, some folks think that these may have been students. Uh, these, these synagogues were provided for uh, wealthy Jewish young men who would come to Jerusalem and stay there and go to the, go to the, uh, uh, go to the college and study law. Paul did that. Paul was, uh, was Saul of Tarsus. But he grew up, but he was trained in Jerusalem under the feet of Gamaliel. And we know that Paul was in this group, don't we? So what we probably have here is a group of seminary students, and uh, they see the work of Stephen, and they start to criticize him. They think, well, we'll just shut this up, start up. And uh, they found that they were no match for his God-given wisdom. And it became evident that they couldn't answer him, so they bribed men to say that Stephen had blasphemed God by saying that God was going to destroy the temple and destroy the law. And that was the accusation. Look at verse 12. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. Verse 13, and they set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. Now, you want to remember those two statements, this holy place and the law, because the rest of his sermon is going to deal with that. They said he speaks blasphemies against this holy place and the law. Now, when you keep that in mind, it'll set a context for the rest of the message that, that we're going to talk about this evening and about what, uh, what Stephen had said. Verse 14, for we heard him say, they're liars, that we heard him say that Jesus should destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that said in the council looked steadfastly on him and saw his face as had been the face of an angel. Well, that ought to scared the fire out of him. They looked at him and saw him like the face of an angel. And the thing about the book of Acts is you have angelic intervention quite often. And uh, either uh, earlier this uh, council, the same council, had attempted to judge the apostles. They locked them in a prison and uh, put a guard outside, and during that night, God delivered those, those apostles and told them to go stand in the temple and speak the words of this life. And the next morning, they're doing this, and uh, the council has convened, and they're getting ready now to call the apostles out of prison. 
and they're going to call them before them and judge them. You know that. That's in chapter 5. And uh, so angels intervened. And here you have Stephen's face as the face of an angel. And the, and the council witnessed that. Now, you can only speculate what this face must have looked like, but I would have liked to have seen it. Can you imagine his face, the Bible said, was like the face of an angel. You have to believe the face of an angel would be beautiful. Evidently, at least in this text, it implies it was something different. Now, many times angels appeared and, and uh, people didn't know they were angels. It says, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for some have entertained angels unawares. And there were times when men saw angels and they thought they were men. They appeared just as men. There's something about his face that is angelic. And uh, maybe like Moses, when he came down off of the mountain, his face was shining. I don't know. As I said, we'll leave this to the more gifted to explain that. <clears throat> now look at verse 2 through 7. You'll notice that, Phil or that uh, si uh, whoever it is here, Stephen starts his message, and he declares that Abraham, their father, was called and given the promises long before Moses ever received the law. Now these hypocrites, they pretend to be defending the law. And he says, first thing I want you to know is that God called our father, Abraham, a long time before the law of Moses was ever given. So God worked independent of the law. God was working before there ever was a Ten Commandments. God was working before there ever was a Mount Sinai. God was working before there ever was a tabernacle. So he said that God appeared to our father, Abraham, and gave him the promises and he emphasizes the fact there that it was before he came to Hiran. Notice what it says in verse 7, 2. Look at chapter 7, verse 2. And he said, men and brethren and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Hiran. In other words, he's saying that before he ever got up to Hiran there, up north up by Babylon, about 600 miles north uh, of Babylon, he said that God appeared to him before he ever got there. God appeared to our fathers. Now, these guys are setting up straight because they're Hebrews and they honor Abraham and they think, well, maybe this guy's going to be a good preacher. So they listen to the introductory parts of his message and uh, they're saying, amen, come on, that's, that's good preaching. And uh, then th the possibility that Abraham would ever become the father, he points this out, the possibility that Abraham would ever become the father of many nations as as uh, as he was promised, appeared impossible. It appeared impossible. Verse 5, look at verse 5 in this same chapter. Look at verse 5. And he gave him none inheritance in it. No, not so much as to set his foot on. So it doesn't look like Abraham is going to uh, receive what God had promised him. It appears that God cannot come through on what he has promised. That's the way it appears. And he's, he's going, he's headed for a point. And he said, yet he promised it to him, even when he had no children. And he was an old man. And the council knew the history of their nation and of Abraham. And they knew that God had fulfilled his promise to Abraham, even when everything appeared unlikely. And now they were in that very land that God had promised them as they sat there and looked at Stephen's face. No doubt many Jews questioned these promises of Abraham. 400 years in Egyptian bondage must have been a cruel mockery to those promises. If you'd have been a Jew and you'd been listening to the traditional message passed down about Abraham, God appeared to Abraham's son, God appeared to our father Abraham, and he promised that one of these days we're going to possess that land. Here it is on a map, and this is a beautiful land of milk and honey, and one of these days, well, when are we going to get it, Mama? I don't know, son, but God promised it. And then that boy sits and he watches his mother die and he watches his father die and then he watches his brother die and watches grandma die and then he gets to be an old man and he dies, never sees the promises of God. 400 years, that's twice as long as America's been here as a, as a, as a country. 400 years, still no promise, uh, no fulfillment. It looked like the promise made to Abraham when he was outside the land was never going to take place. But God was faithful, they were right there in the land, so God had kept his promise. Not only that, to add assurance to it, God gave the covenant of circumcision to Abraham. Not only that, now listen, listen to me. He's used, number one is he's used Abraham. And he's used Abraham before there ever was a law. He's used Abraham and he makes it very clear that it was while Abraham was outside the promised land that God appeared to him. No temple, 
no law, no tabernacle, no land, yet God was with him. God made a promise to our father, and it looked impossible. He didn't give him one place in the land to put his foot. Abraham even had to buy a place to be buried. God gave him nothing. But we're in the land. All right, notice secondly, God was with Joseph. Look at verse 8. Verse 8, he brings Joseph into the picture. He says, as far as verse 8 is concerned, it says, And he gave him, that is Abraham, the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac and, and, uh, and circumcised him the eighth day. And Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. That's a transitional statement taking you to Joseph. And the patriarchs, moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him. Where was he with him? In Egypt. Now, do you see what Stephen's doing? God was with Abraham before he ever came into the land and had a temple or a tabernacle or a law. And now they sold Egypt. They sold. Uh, they sold Joseph into Egypt. But what? God was with him. Now, what Stephen is doing here is he is going to drive home the point that God is everywhere. And that God can keep his promise in spite of circumstances. And God is bigger than the temple. And God was in business before the law. You understand? All right. Now that's where he's headed. And he's got this thing laid out. And it's just as clean as a hound's tooth the way he presents it here. Notice he says that the, the, the patriarchs, the, the patriarchs uh, were moved with envy. And they sold the very one that would be their king and their savior. And when I say savior, I mean keeping them alive in Egypt. That was Joseph. They refused to believe his claims. Here comes the dreamer. Let's see what happens to his dreams. They refused to believe his dreams, and they became envious. Joseph was sold to the Egyptians. He was cast into prison and forgotten by man. It appeared that the promises of God would never happen. However, God was with him. Pharaoh made him governor of all Egypt. Joseph became the provider and the savior. The Hebrew nation was saved. Joseph was rejected by his brethren. But he was made known to them at the second time, and he became their savior. Do you get the picture? And that's, what's, that's what uh, uh, Stephen says, that he was made known the second time. And uh, Stephen knew that Jesus Christ had gone back to heaven. He wasn't known the first time by Israel. Stephen knew he was coming back. He believed that like the rest of the apostles. And that he would be made known... The second time to Israel. And that's why he put that there. That's why he said that. He was made known the second time God, God fulfilled his promise. Stephen is tightening the noose. Abraham was called and blessed before there was ever a Jewish nation, circumcision, or a temple. Joseph was sent to, to, to his brethren. Uh, he was rejected of them. Still God was with him, even while outside the land and, outside, and without a temple. The rejected son of Jacob was exalted, and he became a king and a savior. Now, the message is loud and clear. Knuckles begin to turn white as they grip the back of the pew, and they don't like the direction this sermon is now going. They liked it at first, but now they're beginning to say, I don't think I like this. How much money did you put in the offering? You know, way, you know. And, uh, and the, now the, notice the third thing. He goes to a third person. Look at verse 17. Look at verse 17. It says, And when the time of promise drew nigh that God had sworn to Abraham, and the people drew, uh, grew and multiplied in Egypt, Till another king arose that knew not Joseph, the same dealt subtly with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers, so that they cast out their young children to the end that they might not live, in which time Moses was born. Well, he's dealt with Abraham before there ever was a law, there ever was a temple. He was outside the land, had never been in the promised land. When he got in it, he didn't even get enough inheritance to put his foot on. But you got the land, fellows. You're here. God kept his promise. And then there was Joseph who had a vision from God, called of God, to be a savior and to be a king. But you rejected him and sold him, but he was made known the second time. And God was with him when he was in Egypt, out of the land, without a temple, without a law, without the tabernacle. But God was with him, and you rejected him. Now then he brings up Moses. And notice what he says about Moses. Their condition in Egypt looked hopeless. A new Pharaoh arose, which was determined to destroy all the Jews. This he attempted to do by just drowning the babies in the Nile River. God in his providence led Pharaoh's daughter to have compassion on the babe and spare him. She raised him as her own son. Oh, the wisdom of God. I got to writing this the other day and I just wanted to shout. And so I thought I'd shout a little bit right there for you. Moses, the adult, saw the strife between his people and he sought to reconcile them. And by the way, you'll notice that the, there's a ministry of reconciliation that's taken place 
And that was the idea there, was trying to reconcile all of the Jews back into one nation. It has nothing to do with the church as we know it today, but it was the nation of Israel trying to reconcile them under one king, the Lord Jesus Christ, and they wouldn't have him. And so she raised him, and Moses, uh, when he saw this strife going on, he was rejected, and he left them for 40 years. He left them for 40 years. Joseph was rejected. He was sold, but he left them. You get the picture? The council could not miss the point. Their fathers had rejected the God-given Savior who was sent to deliver them from bondage, just as their fathers had rejected Joseph. They rejected Moses, their Savior. Now the council was rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. Abraham received his call while outside the land and without a temple. Joseph was sold into Egypt. He was outside the land and without a temple, yet God was with him. Moses was in Egypt and in the wilderness without a temple when God appeared to him. He tells Moses that the place was holy ground. Look at verse 33 in our chapter. Look at verse 33. Chapter 7 and verse 33. I think that's what I want. And the Lord said to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. Well, isn't that something? That's outside the land. That's not in the land of Canaan. That's not at Mount Zion or Jerusalem or Mount Moriah. That's down alongside in the Sinai Peninsula down there by, the Mount, by Mount Sinai. But the place where you stand is holy ground. You see? Now these fellows, they, they, they're not liking the way this sermon's going because it's really tightening the noose around their neck. And uh, so uh, <clears throat> Stephen shows them that God appeared to Moses in the wilderness at the burning bush, and there he commissioned him, just like he commissioned Abraham outside the land, just like he was with Joseph outside the land. So what he's telling them, that that land that they're on, as far as God is concerned, is not any important than any other piece of real estate. God is everywhere. And this idea that God is just over there between the Mediterranean and the and the and the and the, uh, the what the Jordan River is uh, is nonsense. You see, and he'll point that out a little bit more. After forty years, Moses returns to Egypt with signs and wonders, commissioned to lead the fathers from bondage. This church, that is the one that Moses was the pastor of, uh, was to be led out and delivered. While Moses was receiving the law at the hand of angels, the nation was backslidden in heart and longed to go back to Egypt. They scoffed and said they didn't know what had happened to Moses. Therefore, they demanded gods to be made, and they rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Stephen, again, is driving home the point. Like their fathers, like their own fathers, they were rejecting God's anointed and worshiping the temple. These Jews put more emphasis on the temple and the law than they did on the Son of God. And God Himself. And uh, that's what He's trying to show them. And they're worshiping the works of their own hands, the temple. See what great stones this temple's made out of. I mean, they loved that temple. And that's what idolatry does. Idolatry changes your affection from God to a physical object. I don't care what it is. I guarantee you, if we put a statue up here on this wall of the Virgin Mary holding a baby, or if we put Jesus hanging on a cross, and you came in here every Sunday and every Sunday and every Sunday, and you saw it, you would start to have some affection for it. You can't help it. It's human nature. And that's why God says don't have them around. Because they start having some kind of holy sanctimonious meaning to you. And they're nothing but wood and plaster of Paris. There's nothing there. But you see, man's nature won't make that distinction. You start having respect for those stupid things. You know, I'm like Gideon, man. Just get a hammer and break every one of them. Now, don't do that. Don't go out and do that, you know. But, it, you know, wouldn't it be fun just to get a rubber statue about six feet long of the Virgin Mary and tie her on the back of your bumper and drag her down the street and let her? Boy, that'd really get you in trouble, wouldn't it? And yet those same Pharisees that get mad about that use God's name every 30 seconds all day long bunch of hypocrites, you know. But you, show, you see what it means is men have more respect for places and objects than they do God. They talk about holy places. There's no holy place. Wherever God is, that's the idea. God is holy. And you think this place is holy, God's going to burn it up. Shows you what he thinks about it. And he destroyed his own temple. So there won't be one rock left upon another. Shows you what he thought of it. And Jerusalem has been destroyed more than any city on the planet. Holy Jerusalem, the holy city. 
Hey, it's been destroyed more than any city on the planet. There's been more bloodshed spilled in Jerusalem than any city. That shows you what God thinks of cities and buildings. They mean nothing to Him. And they ought not to mean anything to you other than a place to keep you warm. <laughs> Boy, that's a misnomer. Or dry. At least it's not leaking yet. I think it's warm enough, though, really. I think, I, think the thing's, I think the thing's working, maybe, up here. <laughs> you got the message, brother. <laughs> he was in my last. I told him. I said. I told these guys. I said, "Listen, you need to keep the place cold and the and the power and, and the sound turned up. That way, nobody can sleep. It's hard to sleep when you're freezing, isn't it? No. Especially if you're freezing and somebody's yelling in your ear. They scoffed. They scoffed, and they said, "We don't know where this Moses went. Therefore, they demanded gods to be made." Uh, Aaron made the golden calf, and then it says they rejoiced in the works of their hand. So Stephen is driving this point home. Like their fathers, they were rejecting God's anointed, and they were worshiping the temple, the works of their own hands. Look at verse 39. It says, To whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him away from them. They wouldn't obey Moses. What did they do with Moses? They pushed him away. That's what that word thrust means. They pushed him away. said, We don't want you. And... Uh, <clears throat> The indictment is clear. Their fathers had thrust Joseph away. Next, they thrust Moses away. Now they had thrust Jesus Christ away. Do you get the picture? That's what he's telling them. He said, you bunch of rebels, you're just like your forefathers and their forefathers. You pushed Joseph away when God sent him. You pushed Moses away when God sent him. You pushed Jesus Christ away when God sent him. Now, they're not liking this a bit. Not only that, he accuses them of idolatry. Look at verse 42 in this chapter. Look down at verse 42. He says, Then God, God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. That's talking about the Hebrew nation. And he's telling them, he says, Your, your, your own God gave you up. Why, he was with Moses, Abraham outside the land. He was with Joseph outside the land. He was with Moses outside the land. But he gave you up. Verse 43. And you took up your tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Rempha, figures which you made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Notice the idolatry that takes place in this nation of Israel. And uh, so the act of idolatry recorded in verse 41 continued until the nation was carried away to Babylon. Now the stages of the captivity are as follows. Syrian, then Damascus, Assyria, beyond Damascus to Mesopotamia, Babylonia to Babylon, and beyond, and now they've been carried to the uttermost part of the earth. I mean, carried away. Israel was warned about forgetting to worship the God of creation, and they turned and worshiped the creation of God. And by the way, that's what, that's what this modern society is doing today. This modern society, ladies and gentlemen, doesn't have the time of day for God, but they worship creation. You know, I'm so mad I could spit nails right now. I just got a letter. We just got a letter today that the city of Linwood has declared 100 feet wide, 300 feet long wetland down here in this little stream that we've been paying taxes on for years and been paying $1,200 a month for a piece of property. That's wetland. They're insane. It's insane. You know why they want to do that? It's so some rodent will have a place to hide. And so we're supposed to let 100 feet wide of trees grow forever down there, 300 feet long. Now, they didn't do it on the property next door, and they didn't do it on the property next door. Figure that out. You know who's behind all of that? The devil himself. See? And that's as dry as powder all during the summer. You see? I mean, it's insane. But some, some bureaucrat who didn't have anything to do, he had to justify uh, getting his check, said, fellows, I had better create some paperwork and do something here because they're going to wonder if I'm doing anything. So we've got to go around and look at some places and declare them wetland. That'll be one. Now, that'll be another one, you see. And so forgive me for, for getting a little bit in the flesh on that, but, but that, I, I get upset about that stuff. You know, we may have to escape to the Soviet Union. Uh, it, it is wicked, it is wicked when people buy land and pay for it and pay taxes on it and then the government takes it. You see, it, it is, that's right. 
It is. And by the way, if they can do that, they can do anything under the sun to you, and you can't do anything about it. You're saying. So you better look up for your redemption draws nigh. And if you think you're going to bring in the kingdom, you're crazy. There is a kingdom coming. You see. All right. Idolatry. The act of idolatry recorded in verse 41 continues. I guess I said that. Israel was warned about forgetting to worship the God of creation, and, and rather they turned and worshiped the creation. And these fellows who talk about the earth and the creation, they don't care about the God who made it. Uh, they only care about money. Deuteronomy 4.19, I'll read it. And lest you lift up your eyes to heaven, God said to Israel, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars even all the host of heaven, that you should be driven to worship them and serve them. You think folks don't worship and serve the stars? Why? People by the millions look for their, look for their sign in the newspaper every day. Oh, what is your sign? I don't have one unless it's the cross. And I don't say that because I think I'm a Catholic. We are informed by Paul that devils are represented by idols. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 19 says, What then? What shall I say then? That an idol is anything? Now, folks, don't get upset at me. Paul said an idol is nothing. That's what it says in your Bible, 1 Corinthians 10, 19. What then shall I say? That an idol is anything? Or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? It's nothing. If it isn't anything, it's nothing. But I say that the things with the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. You get that? I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. That's pretty powerful preaching from the beloved apostle. Israel became so idolatrous that they began to worship the stars and the planets, 2 Kings 17, 16. And they left all the commandments of the Lord, their God, and made them molten images, even two calves. Now you and Brother Larry, you and Brother Mitch and I, we were just in India and we, we thought about you know, how, how much darkness these people must be in to worship cows. Well, if I was going to worship a cow, I'd worship a living one. At least if I got hungry, I could eat him. But anybody that would take some gold and make a cow and worship it, you know, it's worthless. And they took this cow and, I mean, they took this gold and they made a, a, a calves. They made calves and they worshiped them. Notice again, it says in, in verse uh, 2 Kings 17, 16, And they left all the, off the commandments of the Lord their God, and made them molten image, even two calves. They made groves, and they worshipped all the host of heaven, and they served Baal. 2 Kings 21, 3, For he built up again the high places, which Hezekiah his father had destroyed, and he reared up altars for Baal, and made a grove, as did Ahab king of Israel, and worshipped all the host of heaven, and served them. Now listen carefully. And he built altars in the house of Jehovah, of which the Lord said, In Jerusalem will I put my name. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. I mean, right in the tabernacle, right in the temple, and right in the court, they built altars to the host of heaven, to the stars and the planets. You know what they were doing? They were sitting there uh, with the zodiac. That's what was going on there. Notice again, in, in, it's in 2 Kings 23, 5, And he put down the idolatrous priest, whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense. That's the kings of Judah had ordained. The kings of Judah are not to ordain priests. The kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the city of Judah, in the places around about Jerusalem. Them also that burned incense to Baal, to the sun, and to the moon, and to the planets, and all the host of heaven. Israel had a tabernacle prior to the tabernacle commanded by God. In Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5, it said, "...who served unto the example and shadow of a heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, said he, that you make all things according to the pattern shown thee in the mount." So Stephen then is quick to show that their idolatry continued during the time right up through Solomon's temple. Moloch is the god of the Amorites and was associated with infant sacrifice and with immorality. Hurriedly, I'll read some verses. Leviticus 18, 21. And thou shalt not let thy seed pass through the fire of, of, of Mo to Moloch, neither shalt thou profane the name of God. I am the Lord God. Leviticus 20, verse 2. Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, Whosoever be of the children of Israel, or of a stranger, or a sojourner in Israel, that giveth any of his seed to Moloch, 
He shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones, and I will set my face against that man, and I will cut him off from among his people, because he hath given his seed to Moloch to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. And if the people of the land do anyways hide their eyes from the man when he giveth his seed to Moloch, and kill him not, then I will set my face against that man and against his family, and I will cut him off. And all that go a-whoring after him to commit adult, commit whoredom with Moloch from among the people. First Kings eleven seven. Then did Solomon did Solomon build high places to Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Moloch the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did all of his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrifice to their gods. Second Kings 23.10 And he defiled Topeth, which is the valley of the children of Hinnom, that, none, that no man might make his sons or his daughters pass through the fire to Moloch. Jeremiah 32, 34, But they set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name, to defile it. And they built the high places of Balaam, which are in the valley of the sons of Hinnom, to cause their sons and daughters to pass through the fire unto Moloch, which I commanded them not, neither came into my mind, that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. So you see then, when Stephen, or when Stephen here is preaching, and he says, you men of Israel, your fathers, they not only rejected every man of God that was sent to them, they turned away from the God of heaven and they began to worship the planets. Then they picked up the abomination of the Amorites and what they did is they made a, made a brazen image. Now some have said that this image was a huge image that sat with its arms like this. And he sat with his legs crossed and they built a fire in the cavity of his legs. And then people would have these uh, religious uh, meetings that involved all kinds of immorality. And they would get worked up into a fervor. And then they would bring their little children and lay their children in the arms of this, uh, of this strange God and burn their children in burnt offerings. And of course the screams of their children and the chanting and the music all added to the excitement that was going on. That was the kind of idolatry and wickedness that these people had entered into. And that's the, what I've been reading about here in just a, uh, these few verses. I'm just about through. Now, the tabernacle was carried in the wilderness, and later it was brought to the promised land. Joshua was the leader appointed by God. Joshua was the leader that was appointed by God to follow Moses. His name means Jehovah saves. And if you'll look carefully in your Bible there, they, uh, uh, let me just see if I can find where it says it here. I'm looking for the verse about Joshua, or about Jesus. Where they come into the land. Let's see. Eh, maybe I don't have it here, but I'll get it. All right. Notice that it says that... Uh, <clears throat> um, Joshua had brought them in, and uh, because his name means Jesus, or the name Jesus means Jehovah saves, and so does the name Joshua. Some people have supposed that the translators were confused when they talked about, about uh, Joshua and about Jesus. But the idea here is that according to the book of Hebrews, that the captain of their salvation, according to Hebrews, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Joshua chapter 5. In Joshua 5, 13, it says, And it came to pass that when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went over to him and said, Art thou for us or our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said, uh, What saith my Lord unto his servant? of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Loose thy shoes from off thy foot, the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Once Joshua discovered that the captain, who the captain was, he fell on his face and worshipped. And the captain, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 2.10, For it came, for it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, to bring many sons into glory, and make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Stephen knew that Jesus Christ was this captain. Now David desired a temple to be built. His son Solomon was given that privilege. Solomon gave his dedicatory prayer. 
And he made it very clear that it's a fallacy to think that God, that a building could contain God. In 1 Kings 8, 27, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have made. Hurriedly, the response. Stephen's sermon was getting less and less approval from his audience. By this time, they were gritting their teeth, staring daggers at him, like some of you or me. Every pastor worth his salt has experienced this reaction, and I'm confident that many congregations have reacted in their heart as this council. The only reason they have not carried through with this execution is fear of reprisal from the law. Jesus experienced the same thing in, the book, in, in Nazareth in Luke chapter 4. In verse 51, he accuses the nation of stubborn rebellion, closed, calloused heart. He had demonstrated that their fathers had rebelled and rejected the Holy Ghost. Their nation was guilty of killing their own prophets who foretold the coming of Christ. Now they were just like their fathers. The just one had come and they had killed him. The false accusation made against Stephen was that he had spoken against the temple and the law. Look at verse 13 of chapter 6. It says, And they set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against the holy place and the law. He concludes his message by driving home the fact that they were all murderers and hypocrites. God had given the law by the hand of angels, and they had not kept it. Look at verse 33, or verse 53. Who have received the law by the dispensation of angels and have not kept it. Conviction has a strange way of manifesting itself. Peter preached several messages, and thousands were saved. Stephen preaches one sermon, and they bash his brains out. So don't ever... War, you know, you don't know what to expect. Now, this is a good lesson for any pastor or missionary. Some sermons will bring conviction and sinners will be saved. Others will be convicted and will hate you and do everything in their power to destroy you. They would kill you if the law would allow it. Notice that Peter and Stephen both get results. Peter gets results and preaching that gets results must cut to the heart. Stephen, like our Lord, prayed for his enemies. He was filled with the Holy Ghost. He directed his gaze not to the temple. Listen carefully. He directed his gaze not to the temple but to heaven. He saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand. His cry that he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God was more than these Jewish leaders could stand. The miracle of the lame man was irrefutable by the admission of the council. The miraculous deliverance of the apostles by an angel and the magnification of the apostles by the people hindered the intention of the council. But the claims by Stephen that Jesus was standing in heaven at the right hand of God was a claim that they couldn't afford to let stand. Now, you hear me? They couldn't let that stand. These are Sadducees, remember? They don't even believe in a resurrection. By what power have you made this man whole? Well, if we be questioned by what power we've done it, we did it by the Jesus of Nazareth, whom God raised from the dead. They can't have that. Now, here is Stephen, who's done miracles and wonderful pow miracle powers, and he said, I see the heavens open, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Man, that's too much. I mean, if they ever admit that, I mean, they're all in big trouble. So the only way to do this is kill them. And they do kill him. And he says, I see him standing there. This act, listen, here, this, this act completed Israel's unpardonable sin. The Lord warned that the unpardonable sin was connected to Israel's response to the Holy Ghost. The Father's effort to bring Israel to repentance in the Old Testament was always rejected. It was always rejected. That's what Stephen said. You do always reject the Holy Ghost. Israel, and, and, uh, and then he sent to them his only son. The son was rejected, and then he sent the Holy Spirit. Now they are rejecting the Holy Spirit as well. Three is the number of completion. God is a trinity. Man is a body, soul, and a spirit in a ball game. You know that three, you have three chances to hit the ball. Three strikes and you're out. We've witnessed this rule in, with criminals, the three strikes and you're out rule. Three vicious murders now were associated with Israel's demise. John the Baptist was the last of the Old Testament prophets. He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They cut off his head. Jesus preached the same message. They crucified him. Now at Stephen, now Stephen, this Pentecostal church at Israel, was given a third opportunity to repent and they killed Stephen. The beheading of John the Baptist was permitted by Israel. The command, the crucifixion was commanded by Israel. And the killing of Stephen was committed by Israel. 
Jesus was standing at the right hand of the Father. The reason he was standing was because Israel's rejection was not final. He was their high priest. He also awaited their repentance prior to his return to them. At the death of Stephen, everything fades. The heavens are now opened and Jesus is seen by Paul. Listen, Jesus is seen by Paul not standing, but sitting. He's sitting at the Father's right hand. Jesus Christ is the object of heaven. He is the object of heaven. While on earth the heavens opened to him, and a voice said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The heavens opened, and the Spirit was poured upon him without measure. While on earth he was heaven's object. Now, in heaven, the heavens opened that we might look on him. And he becomes earth's object for the Christian. We look into heaven. Stephen saw the heavens open and reveal the Son of Man. We may now look by faith on the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of God, but we see more. We see ourselves seated with Him. He has entered bodily before us and for us. We have entered with Him. At death, our spirits enter where He is. We are now with Him. And at the resurrection, our bodies will be with Him. This knowledge should give us faith and that causes us to live a victorious life while we await the redemption of our bodies. If the Lord should tarry, may we have the privilege to die like Stephen. Let us have the assurance as we read these most comforting words by the Holy Spirit, and he fell asleep. Oh, what a way to die. He fell asleep. He fell asleep. In summary... The growth of the church called for the selection of seven men who were qualified to meet the administrative needs. One of the seven was Stephen. His ministry was powerful and convincing, convicting. Certain Jewish Hellenists brought false accusations against Stephen and summoned him before the Jewish council for judgment. His face shone with the approval of God as he rebuked them of their continued rejection of the Holy Spirit. God had sent prophets to them who told of the coming of Christ. They rejected and killed most of them, yet God was always faithful to his promises. Now they had become the final rejectors of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Their national response was to kill Stephen. However, there was one young man in that crowd who never forgot the message of this first martyr. And Lord willing, we'll talk about that man in the days ahead. Amen. All right, let's bow in prayer. Lord, thank you that we've had this time together. And may uh, what we've said tonight fall on good soil. Thank you for this most blessed word. Thank you for men like Stephen who were fearless, who would stand and preach the word of God. Thank you that he was willing to forgive his enemies, that he was compassionate. But Lord, we thank you most of all that you're the object of heaven and all of the heavens. And uh, at one day we'll see you. By faith we see you now, seated at the right hand of our Father with a, a salvation that is completed. We see ourselves with you because you represent us. One of these days, if we should die, our bodies will go to the graveyard, but our spirits will go to be with you. And then when the resurrection and the rapture takes place, we'll caught up and be transformed like into your glorious body. We thank you, Father.